So my talk today is going to be somewhat about uh, cyclic diet GMP and bacterial signaling. And uh, it will have a somewhat unusual angle. Uh, the angle uh, has to do with the fact that I'm not going to describe much about signaling in bacteria, but rather about the use of bacterial signaling proteins and signaling modalities for applications in biomedicine. Uh, why, why is it important and what do I actually mean by that and why is it relevant to uh, a microbiology conference? Well, I believe that we're, so, we're sorry, living... Sorry, Mark, for the interruption. Could you put your slides for full screen? So currently we can't see much. Could you share it at the full screen? Okay, um, that's... Perfect. Okay, all right. I'm sorry for that glitch. Uh, very well. So uh, we are living in the, in the era of biomedical engineering where uh, mammalian cells and bacterial cells are being engineered as, as new types of biotechnological and biomedical uh, applications. And so as far as engineering of mammalian cells, right? These are engineered for various um, purposes. One of these purposes are um, engineering of cells to fight cancer. Uh, some of the other cell types are engineered for various regenerative disorders where they can produce specific molecules or take place of the cells that have been damaged and, and need to be repaired. One of the common problems with these types of technologies is our inability to control uh, behavior of those, of those cells after they have been introduced into, um, say, human. And so one of the things where um, bacterial signaling modules become useful is in designing a ways to control those cells. And we're particularly fascinated in my group with the um, ability to control those cells with near infrared light. And hence you see these uh, lasers shining light on the cells and controlling their behavior. Well, at this point, we're not working with humans, rather with mice and rats. And uh, some of the stories uh, that we have developed and our collaborators have uh, are something that I'm going to share with you today. So why near-infrared light uh, is uh, a useful and exciting ways to control behavior of engineered cells in, in humans or mammals? Well, there are a couple of things about near-infrared light and specifically light in the so-called near infrared optical window and that window covers approximately uh, a spectral range of 670 to 900 nanometers so the beauty of this spectral range is that uh, this is precisely where the absorbance of hemoglobin is quite low right and hemoglobin is the major pigment in mammals in blood uh, that, that absorbs light. And so light in this area penetrates quite deep into mammalian tissue. And the other nice feature about light, of course, is that it's harmless. And it is something that one can control in a very precise um, temporal manner and with very good spatial resolution. These are parameters that are very difficult to adjust if one uses chemical regulation of cells. So I brought you uh, to show you some of the photos of human flesh, right? You see a thumb, breast tissue, and a fist uh, through which, in this case, just red light goes through, uh, just to illustrate that red light indeed has the, the ability to penetrate through human tissue, and therefore it can be used as a means to control um, activities inside those tissues. Now, near infrared light penetrates even better than red light, uh, but it's on the, 
you know, the light that I'm talking about is on the verge of what we can see. And so I'm not displaying um, pictures of the infrared light. Yeah, and this light is quite safe. In fact, it's been used uh, in a variety of uh, medical applications for quite some time. And you're seeing some of those applications. So <clears throat> in a way, light, the infrared light or light in the near infrared window is a safe, albeit unusual drug that can be used to control cell behavior in mammals. Now, where does one get, um, or how does one develop a way to, to use light in, in uh, mammalian cells, which naturally do not sense light, right? And that's where bacteria in particular and microbes in general um, come to play. We have unbelievable, unimaginable uh, diversity of microbes, right? As, as you can see in uh, one of the representations of the tree of life with huge numbers of bacteria as well as archaea. And of course, each of these microbes have lived a long evolutionary life and they have been able to survive and therefore adjust to sensing their environment and interpreting it. And so what I'm about to tell you is that we can use some of these um, signaling modules that bacteria have evolved to control cells, right? And so one of those modules is a module uh, that, that is involved in sensing near infrared light. So bacteria have all of these sensors of light, yeah, or photoreceptors. These are major classes of photoreceptors, perhaps not all of them, but some of the most common ones. And in general, in bacteria, these classes are involved in sensing primarily blue light. Yeah, blue light is uh, probably used as a proxy to UV light. And of course, UV light is dangerous. And so for most bacteria, sensing blue light means uh, a signal to leave, right? Um, or to start forming a protective layer of a biofilm. Some bacteria, however, sense not only blue light, but also light in other spectral areas. And for our purposes, the most interesting are those that sense light in the far red and mean for red. So there's a subclass of phytochromes, sensors of light from blue to far red uh, that we're particularly interested. These are called bacterial phytochromes. And you will see this abbreviation BPH uh, throughout the rest of this talk. So unlike humans or other mammals, uh, bacterial phytochromes are quite unique to bacteria and, and some fungi. So thus far, um, I've been trying to introduce you to the idea of using engineered cells or, or genes as, as therapy, about using near infrared light or light in the near infrared window as a means to controlling those cells and genes and bacterial phytochromes as uh, photoreceptors from bacteria that can mediate the effects of light. So for the rest of my talk, um, I'll, or the rest of my talk is split into two parts. In, in the next part, um, I will give you some illustration of how we have used cyclic dimeric GMP signaling in bacteria, um, how we use modules involved in cyclic GMP signaling to control behavior of mammalian cells um, through the infrared light. And at the end of the talk, um, I'll spend some time talking about using the infrared lights to control signaling that is shared between bacteria and, and mammals uh, that involves another second messenger, unlike specifically bacterial C GMP. We'll be talking about C AMP. So let me move to the part number two. 
So for those of you who are not familiar with CDI GMP, let me make um, a fairly brief introduction. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a signaling molecule that is at the center of controlling multiple types of bacterial lifestyles. But primarily it's known for controlling um, this transition from single cellular, usually motile lifestyle, to a lifestyle that is involved life on surfaces, which is often sessile. So motile single cellular to multicellular sessile lifestyle is something that CDI GMP controls in a variety of different bacterial species. In addition, it controls a transition from acute to chronic diseases as far as uh, mammals are concerned. Uh, but this is, this is an oversimplification. So here's the molecule, by the way. Yeah, it's a molecule involving two um, guanidine uh, monophosphates. It's a symmetrical molecule. As you can see, these monophosphates are linked with phosphoester bonds, forming this very unusual cycle. And hence, the title of the molecule, the name of the molecule, cyclic or cyclic uh, dimeric GMP. Well, we have stumbled upon this molecule, as she, uh, she mentioned quite some time ago, and have been studying it in bacteria. Um, and this protein was one of the most uh, intriguing to us uh, early on. We're talking about some maybe 15 years ago when this, this, this uh, protein uh, that we named BPHG has fascinated us. The reason it was so fascinating is because it was um, um, a synthase of CDIGMP or diguanylate cyclase. So a protein that makes CDIGMP from GTP on the one hand as an output, but as a sensor for environment, this molecule uh, or this protein senses the infrared light because it belongs to a bacterial phytochrome family. So these three protein domains, PAS, GAF, and PHI, represent a photosensory module that senses the infrared light due to the fact that it binds covalently a derivative of heme known as biliverdin 9 alpha. This is a derivative of heme, as I said. In fact, it's the first product of heme degradation uh, that occurs in bacteria, like Rhodobacter steroides, from which we have derived this protein, but also from humans or other mammals. In fact, I suspect that mammals have acquired the ability to produce biliverdin, probably from, from a bacterial symbiont that ultimately has become a mitochondrion. And so we share the same process of heme degradation as do bacteria of the type of Rhodobacter. We make biliverdin in our cells naturally, and that makes a huge advantage for this type of photosensory proteins because as soon as a protein, an apoprotein like this is produced in mammalian cells, it can be uh, spontaneously coupled with naturally existing biliverdin. So one does not need to provide this chromophore for the um, introduced proteins. Biliverdin is present in uh, practically all mammalian cells naturally. So if one looks at this bacterial phytochrome diguanulate cyclase uh, biochemically, um, one would see uh, something like this. In the dark, this protein has low activity in making CDIGMP from GTP. But if it's irradiated with light, the activity goes up by at least several fold. And spectrally, one can monitor these two states, the dark state, which has an absorbance maximum in this case of about 712 nanometers. And upon irradiation, the absorbance spectrum changes into the red trace here. And that illustrates certain conformational changes in the biliverdin, which we're not going to uh, talk about. Uh, 
bottom line is those changes in the belly burden somehow get transduced to increase activity of the output domain, the digonulate cyclase activity. So what the idea that we've been uh, trying to harness is that because CDIGMP signaling is quite unique to bacteria, mammals do not have it, perhaps we can try to engineer a scheme uh, like shown on the top of the slide and introduce this whole uh, signaling scheme into mammalian cells in such a way that it will be orthogonal to those cells. That is, it will be invisible to the signaling that naturally occurs in mammalian cells. So in this case, we can use CDIGMP as a molecule that performs multiple functions. Functions controlling protein activities or controlling interactions with, pro with interactions between different proteins. And for that, we can use signaling modules that naturally have evolved in, in bacteria. The beauty of CDIGMP as a second messenger of bacterial origin is that it is, as I mentioned earlier, foreign to mammalian cells. So in many cells, it will be neutral to those cells. They will not see it with a few exceptions, uh, especially in immune cells that are particularly tuned to recognize foreign molecules. But in many cells, it is not recognized as such. It's a small molecule, obviously. It's very stable in bacteria, I'm sorry, in mammalian cells, because there are no specific enzymes to degrade CDIGMP. There are no specific CDIGMP phosphodiesterases. These are the types of enzymes that break it down in bacteria. And it has obviously a very simple metabolism, right? It starts with GTP, which is present in all cells. Plus we have a bacterial universe of CDIGMP signaling that we can uh, employ to generate diverse outcomes. So I call CDIGMP an orthogonal drug whose production we can control with knee infrared light and engineer a diverse set of outputs where knee infrared light is the stimulus, CDIGMP is a mediator, and outcomes are multiple. And I will illustrate my points using uh, gene expression as, as one of such outputs. So uh, to mediate the uh, effect of CDIGMP, we have engineered, uh, among others, uh, the following scheme. We picked up a, a couple of proteins from bacteria known as Xanthomonas campestris. It's a plant uh, pathogen uh, that has two proteins, one is called TMX, another one is called PILS, that interact with each other in the presence of CDIGMP. And so we decided to use this property of CDIGMP to um, stimulate heterodimerization as a means to control assembly of uh, heterodimers in mammalian cells. So before moving to cells with some meaning, or with rather with proteins with some meaning, let me illustrate this principle uh, using GFP that in this case has been split in three parts. The barrel of GFP that contains so-called beta strands one to nine, and the two untang untangled uh, beta strands 10 and 11, uh, without which this beta barrel cannot fluoresce. Now, once these two beta strands are brought together <clears throat> with each other, they spontaneously find the rest of the barrel and form a fully fluorescently functional GFP protein. So we use this known um, ability of GFP to be reconstructed from three different parts and engineer the scheme where this reconstruction is driven by CDIGMP, right? And so this is an illustration how this, this process works in E. coli, where in control cells that have low level of CDIGMP, uh, we have um, no output 
of GFP, no fluorescence. And in this case, we're monitoring GFP levels, I'm sorry, the CDI GMP levels in E. coli uh, by plating cells on the uh, indicator medium. Uh, this medium contains a dye, so-called Congo red dye that stains E. coli strains red if they have high CDI GMP levels due to production of uh, so-called curly fimbria. So we use bacteria to basically tell us how much CDI GMP they have. And as you can see, if they do have a lot of CDI GMP, they start fluorescing because this process does take place. Well, in this case, the diguanulate cyclase, that's what DGC stands for, the enzyme that makes CDI GMP. This enzyme is constitutive, um, but one can also use um, a light activated enzyme like the bacterial phytochrome that I showed earlier to basically engineer a scheme where GFP assembly is now regulated by light. And here you see uh, various diguanulate cyclases that are regulated by light um, showing uh, formation of GFP in a light dependent manner. Here and in the rest of the presentation, if you see black bars, that usually means that uh, we're assaying conditions of the dark and red bars generally correspond to near infrared light. All right, so in E. coli, we can make that scheme work. We can make light activated, CDI GMP mediated reassembly of GFP. Now the, the, the task is to basically move this scheme to mammalian cells and with quite a few tricks, uh, but generally using the same idea, one can actually engineer this, this scheme. And so what you see here is uh, behavior of mammalian cells. In this case, there's a so-called HEC cells, HEC uh, 293 cells, uh, just a, an immortal cell line uh, that we're growing in uh, at, at low CDI GMP levels or at high CDI GMP levels. And you can see a uh, uh, dramatic increase in green fluorescence as a result of CDI GMP. So obviously production of CDI GMP is not necessarily the, the main goal, although it, uh, I believe it's a useful tool for monitoring CDI GMP concentrations, uh, both in bacteria and in mammals. But let me show you one of the uh, more practical um, applications of, of this tool, uh, where we're harnessing the ability to control CDI GMP levels in mammalian cells to control gene expression. Right to uh, control gene expression. In this case, we're using yet another bacterial, uh, bacterially derived signaling module. Uh, it's called Tail. This, this is a transcription factor that's no, known in agrobacteria. Agrobacteria inject these transcription, factor, transcription factors into uh, plant cells to, to manipulate plant gene expression in this bacteria-plant interactions. So we and others have been using TAILS as an unusual means to, means to control gene expression in, in mammals. The beauty of tails is that one can engineer them to recognize desired nucleotide sequences. They have a very peculiar organization um, in that they have these 34 amino acid repeats with a specific pair of amino acids that can recognize a single nucleotide. So by designing different uh, 34 uh, amino acid repeats, one can essentially engineer a tail to recognize the sequence of one's choice. And so that allows one to regulate essentially any gene in the genome because a tail can be designed to do that. So this technology is superficially similar to the one that is used in perhaps better known CRISPR-Cas system. Um, it, each of these have certain advantages and disadvantages. 
we like tails because they provide uh, less off-target specificity. Uh, but but bottom line is that they they work, I guess, in a similar fashion to the CRISP system. So, um, how did we control engineer? How did we control gene expression using tails and the split uh, CDIGMP system? Well, in this case, basically, we use the same idea. We split uh, two parts of an activator complex. One part involves DNA binding, and that's been taken from tail. In this case, it's fused to one of the components, Pmax. Uh, the other component that's needed to activate gene expression is a transcriptional activator. And that one has been fused to the second part of interacting complex to pills. And as you can see in the presence of CDIGMP, these two parts are brought together and that uh, constitutes transcriptional activation in complex in uh, mammalian cells. So on the next slide, I'm showing you how the system activates gene expression in, again, in a cultured um, cell line, in hex cell line. Um, essentially, uh, in, in the presence of light activated, of course, diguanulate cyclase and a phosphodiesterase that control CDIGMP level in, in these cells. And so, as you can see, by growing these cells in the dark, or light, uh, one can uh, accomplish multifold uh, changes in gene expression. And of course, if one can control gene expression, you can imagine that instead of having um, an indicator gene, a reported gene, uh, one can have a gene encoding, say, uh, a drug or a hormone, and uh, that uh, sort of engineered cell line can be used for uh, applications in treating diseases. In fact, our colleague in, in Shanghai, uh, Professor Yi, has used just that, right? So basically, I'm showing uh, a slide representing their work where they use this light activated system to control gene expression through CDIGMP in engineered cells that now produce um, insulin and once these cells are introduced in mice, they can be controlled by near infrared light. You see an LED uh, emitting near infrared light into mouse. And these cells have been harnessed to produce insulin uh, dependent on the level of the glucose in blood in such a way that these mice with implanted engineered cells uh, could go on and to have uh, normal insulin levels for, for weeks of the time, uh, being simply treated with uh, knee infrared light on a daily basis. All right, well, let me move on um, to the last part of my presentation. Uh, and this part involves not orthogonal system like CDIGMP, but rather a system that is shared between uh, mammals and bacteria, many bacteria, uh, cyclic AMP regulation. So the idea here was uh, that uh, instead of using orthogonal second messenger, perhaps we can engineer a bacterial phytochrome to control uh, CAMP. Now, CAMP obviously is a universal um, second messenger in mammals. It controls a variety of different things. Um, and these things, these processes that are controlled by CAMP range from control of cell growth to cell dif differentiation, actually to controlling of insulin levels in, in, in natural environments, to controlling uh, pacemaker cells in the heart to learning and memory formation in the brain and so on and so forth. So CAMP is truly a remarkable second messenger in mammals and it's and pharmaceutical industry has been trying to control processes involving CAMP for quite some time with rather limited success. And success is limited because 
uh, in different cell types, CAMP controls diverse sets of processes and drugs that have been designed usually to control degradation of CAMP, they obviously control that degradation in a variety of cells as well. So um, a drug that may perhaps improve learning and increase CAMP levels are uh, involved in that. Um, at the same time, may have a side effect of speeding up uh, heartbeat. So perhaps not, not the best outcome, especially given that some of the other outcomes would be increasing in intestinal fluids, right? And that would lead to diarrhea. Not the best uh, combination. On the other hand, if one is able to control CAMP levels with the precision afforded by light, perhaps one can overcome some of these difficulties or, or some of these problems. And so hence, we've uh, embarked on the idea of engineering a bacterial phytochrome uh, that instead of CDIGMP will control activity of an adenylate cyclase. So we can have CAMP production controlled by the infrared light. So uh, I don't call this process even protein engineering because at least at, at the time when we started, it looked like we've been playing with bacterial signaling modules like toddlers play with Lego blocks. Hence, legoing of bacterial phytochrome chimeras. Well, in this legoing process, of course, we have relied on some knowledge about how bacterial phytochromes work in general. And this is represented here um, on two uh, schemes, one of which represents a homodimer of a bacterial phytochrome with output domains shown as uh, wings of a butterfly. As you can see in the dark state, uh, this homodimer uh, forms a conformation where the output domains are inactive and upon irradiation with light, uh, Billy Verdon, that's bound right here, uh, induces quite drastic conformational changes in the dimer that repositions the output domains in the active form. So we knew about this much at the time when we started uh, engineering proteins uh, that will have adenylate cyclases, adenylate cyclase domains in place of uh, diguanylate cyclase domains. Uh, these domains are called GGDF domains. So in this case, again, we're using uh, bacterial signaling modules Right, uh, we started with bacterial phytochrome from uh, Rhodobacter steroides, the one that I showed you earlier, and adenylate cyclase domains from uh, a cyanobacterium called Nostoc. And so, following um, quite painful, I must say, uh, and and lengthy engineering process that involved a variety of ideas of how to fuse these domains, we ultimately uh, have come to understanding of what needs to be done and how this can be done. And I will not talk about the uh, details of this engineering um, aside from the uh, outcome, right? So by using uh, an E. coli based uh, screening system, we have ultimately identified proteins, chimeric proteins that behaved something like the one that's shown here at number 25, where E. coli grown in the dark would not, would not produce um, a CAMP dependent product. In this case, it's just a beta galactosidase and an X gal blue light, I'm sorry, blue white uh, screening assay, uh, but will produce blue colonies in the light. So, this represents a variant of the fusion protein that responds to light. Well, our first proteins that we engineered um, a few years back uh, have shown to work very well in obviously E. coli and some of the more primitive animals like C. elegans and where they can control uh, various processes in response to light. But it turns out that this protein had uh, 
pretty bad expression in mammalian cells and low activity at 37 degrees. And so that prompted us to um, truly endorse the idea of legoing uh, and that is engineering of these proteins using signaling blocks from diverse bacteria. So ultimately, we had to replace the uh, photosensory module from Rhodobacter with something much more sturdy. It comes from a bacterium called Dinococcus radiodurans that also has bacterial phytochromes. So a photosensory module from a Dinococcus and adenylate cyclase domain um, that works best in mammals at this point comes from mycobacteria, obviously uh, a pathogen that causes tuberculosis, um, does have ad adenylate cyclase that um, is active at 37 degrees. So that was our rationale and indeed um, a hybrid containing these two uh, signaling modules has proven to be uh, quite effective in uh, at, at 37 degrees and, and stable in expression in mammalian cells. So what you're looking at here is um, adenylate cyclase activity in the dark and in the light of this uh, newly engineered adenylate cyclase at 37 degrees. Yeah, so compared to our original version that had very low activity and poor expression. Once this, this system, or once this protein is uh, moved to mammals, obviously, right, we, we need to show that, that it works. And I'm illustrating this um, using an example of regulation of neuronal activity that is involved in memory consolidation. So uh, both humans and mice, um, consolidate their memory, that is form long-term memory during sleep. Um, it's important to have good sleep, uh, right? And, and this is due to the fact that uh, several regions of the brain, in particular thalamus and cortex, uh, exchange very specific electrical signals called spindle waves or spindle oscillations. So we knew before that uh, spindle oscillations are controlled by uh, CAMP dependent ion channels and hence we used the system uh, to verify that adenylate cyclase works. So our colleague uh, Kin Kwan San at the University of Wyoming has uh, injected uh, an adeno associated virus expressing the slight activated adenylate cyclase in thalamic neurons and had been monitoring this electrical exchange between thalamus and cortex and it's in a simplified version it's shown right here you can see that this electrical exchange occurs normally uh, before a laser is uh, shown on uh, a mouse brain or an led panel is turned on uh, because we're dealing with near infrared light this light does penetrate through mouse skull uh, and controls neurons that are positioned quite deep in, in mouse brain. And so we see suppression of this electrical activity uh, during irradiation and restoration of this activity after a little bit of pause, uh, restoration of this activity when the light is turned off. So this adenylate cyclase indeed um, do, does work in, in mice and we're hoping to use it in a variety of applications including neuronal regulation but also regulation of production of hormones like insulin uh, because that production is naturally controlled by CAMP levels. And so in summary I gave you uh, I guess uh, vignettes on how one can harness the diverse signaling pathways in bacteria primarily pathways that involve near infrared light and either bacterial second messengers or second messengers that are common to bacteria and, and mammals. I think this, this uh, sort of technology has a variety of interesting applications, uh, but that's probably um, the um, subject of um, a presentation a few years down the road. 
So before I finish, uh, let me acknowledge people who have done all of this work. So I must admit I've been involved in some of the thinking, uh, but all of the doing was, was done by uh, very talented and hardworking graduate students. Min Hyang Ru, here's Min Hyang, Stacy Famichova, this is Stacy, Taylor Doherty, here's Taylor, Marina Lazic, who is not on this slide. And the mouse experiments were done by the group of Kim Kang San at the University of Wyoming. The tail uh, systems have been engineered uh, in the group of Roman Yerala at National Institute of Chem Chemistry in Slovenia. And Tina Debar was the uh, key uh, student involved in those projects. With that, let me acknowledge also funding from the uh, national agencies in the United States. And um, I'm happy to hear your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark. That's a very interesting talk, isn't it? And we do have a time for a few questions. So here, the first one um, from Benjamin says it's very cool technology uh, for the orthological drug. Um, so she wants to. He wants to know that in bacteria and higher organisms, does the second gene be produced by system stay within the cell? And if it is somewhat diffused, does that limited the spatial and the temporal control available? Right. Well, that's an excellent question, Benjamin. Um, and and we're just beginning to address it, really. Yeah. So at this point, we've been using um, the signaling molecules um, in in mammalian cells, assuming that CDIGMP will simply spread throughout the cell. Um, and of course it does. This is not, and, and it, it, it generally does not leave cells unless one expresses it at very high level, then it does spill over from one cell to others. In fact, there are also mechanism of sharing so-called CDIGMP uh, in specific um, arrangements. Uh, what, what would be smarter, and, and that's what we're starting to do, uh, is to actually um, localize signaling mo uh, modules uh, involved in CDIGMP signaling, right? And so to some extent we have done it. Um, you may or may not have noticed that some of the phosphodiesterases in the uh, gene expression systems have been tagged, say, to the nucleus. Yeah, and so the idea there was that uh, nucleus is kind of the, the, the place in mammalian cells where we want CDIGMP levels to be the lowest uh, in the absence of light, yeah, to, to keep uh, low, dark uh, background um, in cells where we control gene expression. Um, but uh, controlling things with uh, in space in mammalian cells is, is indeed uh, something that we're just starting to, to, to do. Thank you very much. We've got another one. Um, so uh, Katrina Lee wants to know a little bit more about the tail system. And uh, for the uh, gene speci uh, specificity, like how many mismatches can to be allowed or uh, tolerated? Right. Um, so, so indeed, tails do have uh, almost perfect uh, specificity, but almost is the key. Uh, uh, as, as everything in biology, right? Nothing is perfect. Mm -hmm. Everything is just as good as, as, as is needed uh, to work. And, and so I, I will hesitate to, to give you numbers here, right? But there is, there is some uh, misspecificity. Mm -hmm. In engineered cells, uh, one of the ways to deal with it is to, to uh, have multiple tails to control gene expression, right? One can design several of them that will increase the number of nucleotides that can be recognized. Um, um, that I guess that's, that's one way of doing things. Or if one is not limited by the size of the DNA that is introduced in engineered cells, one can design uh, sequentially positioned tail sequences and that will increase specificity as well. So there are means to, to somewhat uh, modulate uh, specificity of mm -hmm. tails. Okay. Okay, thank you. 
very much, Mark. And I got a question from myself, actually. I'm um, just wondering, you talk a lot about using the uh, modulation emojis um, to regulate uh, gene expression in uh, human or mammals. Have you ever tested anything um, in plants or trying to control like growth hormone expression? And uh, as we know, some of the modules actually come from plant pathogens or plant, uh, you know. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Th thanks for this question. Uh, we have not been uh, working with plants, but uh, there are several groups uh, in the world that are doing just that, yeah? regulating uh, plant uh, behavior and production of chemicals in plants using uh, these or similar modules, because bacterial phytochromes and phytochromes, which are present in all plants, mm -hmm. are come from the same same family and so plants sort of naturally have uh, those light responses a diverse set of light responses already um, uh, and several groups in the world are doing that 